honestly, when I think about even our church, not just church in general, but our church, for some reason, I always go back to think of my family. If you're a parent here, uh, let me see your hand. How many parents we got? Do you remember the very first time you brought your first child home? Man, I was scared out of my mind. He's in the room. I'm not going to point him out. But um, my little guy, so here's what I loved about being in the hospitals, that there was doctors everywhere to take care of everything, right? They came in and told Lindsay and I, brand new baby. You know, I babysat kids before, but it's a little different, you know, um, than babysitting nieces or nephews and having your own kid. They told us how to swaddle that baby, right, without strangling it, put that thing around it. They told us when to feed the baby, and they came around and interrupted our sleep about every two hours, right, to do what? They took all the vitals, right? They're checking temperature. They're checking heart rate. They're doing all blood pressure, all of that stuff. And then after a couple days, they just throw you out. I've got no monitoring machines at my house. I got no, t- you know what I mean? What am I supposed to do? Who do I call if something goes crazy? And I'll be honest, I don't know if any parents ever done this, but I have, especially with our first, the other ones, you know, whatever. But our first one, (laughs) that first one, I would wake up in the middle of the night concerned if it was still breathing. You know what I'm saying? I'd sneak in there like, (laughs) stare at it for five minutes, trying to turn the light on, put my finger on his nose, you know. (laughs) And now I don't know what they're doing when they're sleeping. I got little ones, you know. But it's, it's intense, and you just gotta figure it out. They trust you. They just ship you home. They make sure they're buckled in right, and then you're gone. Little piece of paper, birth certificate, we'll see you later. Come back in a few weeks to make sure everything's still good. And when I think about that, I go back to thinking about the church, about us. But then it also throws me back to the very first church that came about after Jesus left. There was this moment Jesus and his disciples, you can read about it in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the first four books of the New Testament, where Jesus is leaving. He's out of here, and he gives them a few instructions. And it wasn't like they had hung out with Jesus for 40 years, or even 30 or 20 years, or even 10 years. They'd hung out with him for three, three and a half years. That was it. And they watched him, and they followed him, and many people came to believe on him as God's son. And then he's getting ready to leave, and he says, hey, uh, go into all the world and preach the gospel and make disciples, and I'll see you later. And they're left there. They're left there watching Jesus go up into heaven. The Bible documents, and an angel was there and said, hey, man, you guys got to get going. This, just as he left, he's coming back again. But until then, just go do what he said to do. And they began to figure it out. They began to wrestle through what does it look like to be a a faith community, a group of people devoted to Jesus and to his teachings, and they made mistakes. And we, in, in our Sunday school class this morning, I'm teaching through the book of Acts, we began talking about that this week, that they didn't have it all figured out. There wasn't a blueprint. There wasn't a Bible that Jesus handed them, some manuscript that they could go through, and the Bible was being written without them even realizing it. Their lives were being documented And what Jesus did and said and passed on to them, then what they began to do and say and pass on to the next generation of disciples, and the gospel began to spread while they were figuring it out. Now, while they were figuring it out and making mistakes and being called out, we read this morning that they were so consumed with preaching the gospel that they had left a group of widows to fend for themselves, and they got corrected, and they had to rethink the way they were doing ministry. We, we've got to be able to preach the gospel. We have to, Jesus said to take care of the least of these. We've got to figure this out, and so they did it right sometimes. They did it wrong sometimes, but while they were figuring it out, somewhere between 57 and 60 AD, a word arose among the non-Jesus followers that began to be a way for other people, these non-believers, to describe this group of people because everyone was watching. There was a conversation going on about this, what started out as a small group of people that multiplied into thousands and thousands of people. What do we do with these people? Is what they're saying believable? Is it true? Is this Jesus who they're following really the real deal? Is he who he said he was, God's son? 
And did he really do what he said he was going to do, which was be crucified on a cross and then three days later be raised from the dead? Is this all legit? Is this for real? And so to describe this group of people, you know, I don't know what words they used all the time, those crazy people, those Jesus followers, but this word arose among non-believers to describe them the best they could, and it was the word Christian. It was the word Christian. As a matter of fact, we're going to read out of the book of Acts chapter 11. It says this, Acts eleven twenty six. It was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christian. Now, Antioch was this um, kind of hub of commerce in the Roman Empire. And modern day, it'd be southeast Turkey is where Antioch kind of exists today, where it would have been. And, and this group of people were so apparently devoted to Christ and Christ's teachings, there was no other word that they could use except for, look at these Christians, these Christ-like people. Now, they were never intending on giving themselves the name Christian. That wasn't the plan. They weren't trying to set up a new religion. But we know today that if you look at world religions, Christianity is one of 4,200 world religions. That's the estimate. About 4,200, there's five major religions, but about 4,200 world religions. And if you look them all up, Christianity and alphabetical orders just kind of plop there in the seas. Their intention, these first century believers, were never intending on starting a religion of any kind or to hope to be listed in Wikipedia one day as one of 4,200 religions that you can follow. That wasn't the whole intention. They were just trying to figure out what does it mean to follow Jesus and his teachings the way that he intended for us. Now, the great news is Jesus said, I'm, I'm never going to leave you or forsake you, which seems contradictory since he left. Then he said, but I'm going to send my spirit so that though you can't see me and you may not be able to reach out and touch me, my spirit's going to be within you, guiding you. And they did their best to follow the leading of God's spirit. Sometimes they did it right on and sometimes they messed up. I don't know if you ever have, but I have. All these years later, God's Spirit is still guiding those of us that are Christ followers. And sometimes we get it right, and sometimes we get it wrong. We're in good company because the very first few disciples went through the same thing. And while they were doing that, you know, they, they were trying to describe what it meant to be not a Christian because that word hadn't quite existed yet. But Paul, this very first century devoted Jesus follower, who once was a persecutor of these Christians before that word was a word, imprisoning them, seeing to their death and demise, he wrote, though he had never visited Rome, he wrote this letter, one of many letters he wrote to these Jesus followers in Rome. And these Jesus followers were brand new in the faith. They were trying to figure out what does it mean to follow Jesus. So he wrote this amazing Book. If you've never read the book of Romans or you're not a Bible reader, this week jump into Romans. You will love it. There's going to be some moments that are a little confusing, but just read through it. I promise you're going to love it. And in that book, Paul tries to explain this whole what does it mean to follow Jesus. This next verse in the book of Romans says this in a second. Yeah, for we don't live for ourselves or die for ourselves. If we live, it's to honor the Lord. So let's just pause right there. If we're going to live this life, there's one reason we're going to live. It's going to be to honor the Lord. Now, if we die, it's to honor the Lord. So whether we live or whether we die, our lives, we belong to the Lord. So before the word Christian existed, this is what it meant. That if we're alive, man, that's amazing. Our lives belong to the Lord. That's what, it, that's what it means to follow Jesus. And if we're not here, if we die, our lives belong to him anyways. And so if you could sum up, what does it mean to be Christian? Why were these people even called that word? It's because there was a group of people that were devoted. Their lives belonged to Christ. And whether they lived or died, they were all 
his. Now, as they were figuring this whole thing out, this whole Jesus following, this whole what does it look like for my life to belong to Jesus, Paul also wrote to these Christians in Rome, here's what it looks like to follow Christ. He was giving him some structure. Now, he didn't give them complete structure because they were still figuring it out. But he gave them some structure so they knew how to interact one with another because the church wasn't just Paul. It was this gathering of very, I mean, look around you guys. Just go ahead, look around. There's a weird group of people in this room. Very eclectic crowd, right? Different ages, right? Grew up in different areas, different beliefs, different places in our faith. Very churched, brand new to churched, kind of churched. Not too sure what to think about all this. Very convinced, you know, some people call this church home. Some of you guys are first time guests. And so it's a very eclectic crowd, just like it was 2,000 years ago. And as they were figuring it out, Paul set some boundaries for them. Now remember, the boundaries that he set eventually got them called Christian. What does it look like? What did this group of people look like that the outsiders would look at them and say, man, those people are so much. Here's what I want to do. I want to rapid fire some verses out of Romans. We could spend a ton of time talking about every single one of these because they're all great. But let's rapid fire a a few uh, Romans verses. Romans 12.10, be devoted one to another in brother love. Like, Like we're family, right? Honor one another above yourselves. The next one, still in Romans, live in harmony with each other. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Next one, Romans chapter 13, let no debt remain outstanding except continuing debt. I love this. Our debt is to love one another. We owe each other love. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. Romans 14, therefore let us stop passing judgment on one another. Now we could talk about that for weeks, but let's stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. Again, he's using the word brother because we are, yeah, we're family. Accept one another. Then, just as Christ accepted you, in order, let's pause this, in order to bring praise to God, It brings praise to God to do what? To accept one another. The next one, this is my favorite. Greet one another with, oh, it says kill. That is completely my fault. What it's supposed to say. (laughs) Oh, man. What it's supposed to say (laughs) is greet one another with a holy, there it is, a holy kiss. What if we started implementing that? That's how you greeted everyone at church. A holy kill or a holy kiss. What's interesting, I should have done that all on purpose, actually. That would have been such a, gr- anyways. So th- there's this run of scriptures within Romans as Paul is trying to, here's what he's really trying to do. Remember, they did not have a Bible to have structure. They had God's spirit, and they had each other. They had the disciples telling them what Jesus said, and they were just like me getting Abraham and kind of just going home with this kid. You know what I mean? Am I going to break this kid if I don't? You know what I mean? What do I do here? Is He's three days old. Should I give him a spanking? I mean, he's crying too much. What do I do, you know? No? Is that, well, I shouldn't have done that? Oh, it only happened a couple times. Anyway, so... um, They were trying to figure it out. And while they were figuring it out, Paul lays out for them how they should look, what they should do. And here's what I love about it. None of it was about setting up the religion. None of it had to do with what oftentimes, not necessarily here at this church, but globally, what we make religious gatherings about. It appears what it was about was just us. It seems like that's what mattered most, how we loved one another and treated one another. Because that word Christian then 
means something very different than it does 2,000 years later. If you were to survey your neighborhood or your place of employment, and you ask them, define for me the word Christian, there would be a, an amazing amount of definitions for that word, wouldn't there? Right? And even today in this room, my guess is we have some differing opinions of what the word Christian actually means. How can there not be? When we turn on the television, the God of the Christians is being talked about matter-of-factly in all kinds of different ways. When something crazy, or you, you, you can watch football today, and you're going to see someone holding a John 3.16 banner, right? When they're kicking field goals or they're, right? No? Yeah? No? Someone nod your head or something. Okay, thanks. That banner man's out there with John 3.16. Now, if someone were to see that and know that was from the Bible and go look at it, that would paint a picture that God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever were to believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That paints a picture of who God is, the Christian God to the world. And then the same God that Christians claim, you'll see people in rallies and at protests holding up signs that say God loves you or and then whatever, whoever the people group is. They're holding up signs, like picket signs. God, and so that starts to define for people what a Christian is. It seems like these Christians are very loving, and it seems like they're proactive. They're getting out in their community and saying that God loves you. And then at this very same rally or protest, you can see another sign being held by another person who would say that they're Christian, and that sign says, God hates, and then you can fill in the blank. And I lived, in, I lived in Las Vegas for quite a while, and, um, and living there, there's a lot of street preachers uh, on the Las Vegas Strip. A lot of people there, great opportunity to preach the gospel. And there was one gentleman that um, I had several conversations with, just a sweetheart of a guy, and uh, he had his bullhorn and his sign talking about how God loves you and forgives you. And that, and people were to ask him, hey man, are you Christian? Yes, and this is what the Bible says about God. And that would represent Christianity one way. And a block down the road, block up the strip, there's another person with a bigger sound system, a little bit louder to drown out the other guy who they're, they're, supposed, they're apparently brothers, but they don't act like it. And everything he's saying seems to be the opposite of what this person is saying. God's mad at you. You're going to burn in hell for an eternity. There's going to be some, like, something called weeping and gnashing of te teeth and worms and lakes of fire and stuff. And so then listening to this person, it appears that we're talking about two different gods. And so now if this same group of outsiders in the first century were to look at these people, I wonder what word he would give them. Would it be Christian? Which forces me to ask myself about me and my family, about our church family. If this first century group of people in Antioch were to interact with us, what would he call us? Or what would they call us? Because it looks like from what Paul said in Romans... That what they focused on, their lives belonged to God. They were devoted to him and they loved him and their lives belonged to God. And then Paul makes it very clear that not only are they to love God, but they are, you're to love each other and be devoted to each other. It appears not that loving others gets you to heaven because only faith in Jesus Christ can do that. But it appears that having faith in Jesus Christ and being devoted to him means being devoted to each other. That's what it appears like it means. And actually loving God causes you to love others. That's what it appears. What Paul is trying to get across to the Jesus followers in Rome. And that when we love God and we're loving people, when others look, they will say, look how much they are like Christ. And it sounds very elementary, and it sounds very easy, 
But I can just tell you, it's not always easy to say my life belongs to God. Whether I live or whether I die, my life belongs to God. For some of us in the room, we can say that with full confidence. My life belongs to God. And you can give me a day that you surrendered your heart to Jesus Christ. And you say, my life belongs to God. And whether I live or whether I die, I'm all in. And some of us, we're still wrestling with our faith. And some of us, we may not have much faith at all. And then it appears the next step, almost a reflection of our belonging to God, is how much we are family and how we interact one with another. Because when people walk in here, when they park their car and they decide to walk in these doors, what they should experience, what we should be experiencing is joy and love. We've been redeemed. For those of us that are Christ followers, our lives have been transformed. How could we not reach out and love others? And so when people walk in, my, my question to myself is, how much when people are around me, are they experiencing the fact that Paul writes to these people that are not brothers and calls them brothers. And he says to stop judging and start accepting. I wonder, I have to ask myself this question, when people interact with me, do they feel judged or accepted? Do they feel loved? Do they feel like they're just kind of, hey, I don't know you, you don't me, but we're family? Or do they feel kind of at an arm's distance away? And let me be super clear about something. Let's just take a time out, take a deep breath. What I'm not asking you about is your personality. I'm not asking you if you're a natural extrovert or an actual introvert or what your Myers-Briggs test says or what your anagram is. If that, if that doesn't make sense, you just, just Google it later. It's personality tests. I'm not asking you what comes natural to you? Because I'm a very, um, you can tell I'm an extremely shy, quiet individual. No, but some of us just are. Some of us are just shy and introverted. And some of us are very loud and boisterous. And, and so I'm not talking about getting a mic in your hand. Or I'm not talking about preaching. I'm not talking about being like Paul and writing letters that end up in a Bible. That's what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about... What do people experience when they're around you? With a very loud voice or your little soft voice? With you being extremely introverted or extremely extroverted? And the excuse starts to come. Listen, I've been a pastor for 18 years, which is not as long as a lot of people. But in my short 18 years of pastoring, I have come to realize that we, and I'll just use myself, I am great excuse makers when it comes to things we just don't want to do. And it starts young, right? With three words. I don't wanna. I don't wanna eat my peas, mom, right? Five years old, three years. I don't wanna go to bed. I don't wanna go to grandma's house. She smells, you know. Have you ever heard that? Not you, grandmas. I've heard of some grandmas. I don't... I don't want to do, I don't want to do my homework. I don't want to. And I get it. But if your life has been transformed by, I, I get that you may want to just sit on your butt in the same seat you sit in every week when you come to church, but there's some people in this room that need a friend and that need to be loved. God forbid you get up out of the chair that you're in and go sit by somebody brand new that you've never seen before. <laughs> I know it would be like parting the Red Sea for some of us. <laughs> or when someone walks through those doors to put your coffee down and get up and go serve them. Why? Not because you're on a volunteer team, but because your life has been transformed. And you are compelled to go, here's, here's how Paul says it in 2 Corinthians, in a letter he wrote to the group of Corinthians. He says it like this, Christ's love urges us on. We believe that Christ died for all. We believe that we have also died to our old life. We actually believe that Jesus died for who? Read it, come on. Jesus died for all. Can you guys not read that? A-L-L? Okay. Hold up. 
It's right. Oh, you went to Denfeld? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't say it. I just repeated the joke. Relax. It's right there, and it's right there. We believe that Christ died for all. Yeah, all. For you and for people just like you and for people not like you at all. For people that believe the same way you do and people that don't believe the same way you do. The people that have a great personality and people have an annoying personality. For people who voted the same way you did and people who didn't vote the same way you did. He died for all. all. And so how do we treat all? We treat all like family. We get up and we are aggressively loving other people. We take action when it comes to our faith. Because James is very clear. What good is your faith if you sit on your butt? That's the, my revised version of the whole thing. <laughs> faith without works is just, it's just kind of dead. It's just there. It's just limp. We take action with our love. Put your coffee down. Get out of your seat. Love somebody brand new. Instead of watching them walk in. Holding on to three kids, not sure where to go. Let me show you where the check-in is. Restroom's right up here. Would you sit with me? I'd love to sit with you today. That's what love does. And those traits were being watched by all these people in Antioch. They're, they're watching, they're observing. They're not sure what to do with it. And there's only one word that could describe what they were doing. Christian. Those people have got to be following Christ. They're, these Christians, they're the only people I know that would do that stuff. They're the only people I know that would love people different than them, that would forgive their enemies. Do you know, what, you know how wronged they were? When Paul wrote in Romans, pray for those in authority and submit to them, you know who he was talking to? The most anti-Christian government in history, slaughtering Christians in Rome, and Paul tells them, pray for them, love them, and be subject to them, to Caesar. And people are watching, and they're so compelled by what they see, they brand them, those people are just like Jesus was. That's powerful. I have to ask myself, are those traits in me? And maybe we can all ask ourselves that same question. Are those traits in me where I don't have to wear a Christian t-shirt? I mean, if you do, great. You don't have to have a Christian bumper on your, your sticker on your, on your car. You don't have to walk around with a Bible for people to know you're a person of faith. They know it by the love you have for one another. It's amazing how unjudgmental that person is of my, I'm so messed up. And all they did was love and accept me and point me to love and forgiveness through Jesus Christ. I've never had anyone treat me like that before. That will be the greatest sermon ever preached in the world. Will not be in pulpits, but when we love people the way Christ commanded us. And that's the church Jesus envisioned 2,000 years ago. A group of people so devoted to God and so devoted to each other, and so devoted to reaching other people that their mark was love. Jesus did not save you to become Christian, to join a religion. For those of us that are Christ followers, he transformed our lives because we needed him deeply, and we could not pull off forgiveness on our own. And then he, God knew that the world around us would need the same love that Jesus was showing people, but Jesus left, so we place the ball in your hands and mine. To love, to care, to be a family, a family of misfits for sure, but a family. Im imperfect, right? An imperfect family, but a family. A family with arms open to all who would enter. We will be that type of community, this church. We can let God's light, remember that, 
kids, I didn't grow up going to church like when I was in elementary school and stuff like that. But there's that little song, uh, This Little Light of Mine, I'm Gonna Let It Shine, right? You actually have to shine to shine. You, you actually have, shining is a proactive thing. And the greatest way to bring Jesus to the world is by reflecting him. 1 John 4, 7, 8. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God. He that loveth not does not know God, for God is love. I'm going to ask the worship team to come on up. Would you bow your heads with me? Let's pray. Actually, would you stand with me? Would you stand with me? And before our team leads us in one last part of a song, here's my prayer for me. Can I just tell you what I'm going to be praying for me? And I promise I'm going to pray this for you as well. That it would be said of me, that it would be said of us, that the light of God's love shines bright in this place. That everyone who walks through those doors is met with a bull rush of people waiting to serve them. And to love them. To invite them to sit. To invite them over for dinner. So that we are no longer outsiders to each other, but insiders. That we move from acquaintances to family. That's my prayer for myself. My prayer for you. Would you bow your heads with me? Let's pray. Father, I'm grateful for your goodness for your love. God, what a challenge that Paul places before us in the book of Romans. That our lives would belong to you. And God, if there's anyone here that doesn't know you in a very real way and our lives don't belong to you, God, I pray you would do a work in their hearts, speak to their hearts today. There are some that are wrestling with faith today. It's okay. God's okay with your wrestling. God, I pray you do work in their hearts today. Do something special. Do something unique. And God, I pray for myself, for Lindsay, for my kids. I pray that we would love in such a way that it could only be said of us that we're like you. I pray that for my family, and I pray that for my church family. May we be so filled with love and grace, and mercy. May we be such a tight-knit family and inviting others to be in our family that it transforms every person that walks through these doors. That it transforms the city.